and welcome Good to morning, River City. And welcome to River City. My name is Pastor Larger. My name is Pastor Larger. We're so excited, you're, we're so excited you're here with us this morning. Before we get started with before service, why don't you take some time to say, hello to, some time to say hello to a few people in the chat? Or you can stop by the or notes you can section, stop by the notes and, section helpful and, get and get some helpful links to our website. Online giving, online giving, kids activities, kids activities, or next steps. Or next steps. We're so excited you're here with us. We're so excited you're here with us. We hope you have a blessed Sunday. Good morning, and welcome to River City. My name is Pastor Larger. My name is Pastor Larger. We're so excited, you're here, so excited you're here with us this morning. Before we get started with Before service, we get started with service, why don't you take some time to say hello to a few people in the chat? Or you can stop by the or notes you can section, stop by the and, notes section and get some helpful links to, and get some our, website, links to our website. Pastor Online giving, giving, kids giving, kids activities, kids activities, or next steps. Or next steps. We're so excited you're here with us. We're so excited you're here with us. We hope you have a blessed Sunday.
Welcome to River City. My name is Jackie. Our service today will last just over an hour. We're going to spend some time singing together and hear a challenging and inspiring message from God's Word. If at any time you would like prayer, please reach out to us. We're just a click away.
You met me at the sinner's table. I found you waiting by the well, unexpected.
like you do the wind And I'll chase your voice through the dark Fix my eyes on the unexpected In the wonder of your shadow step So take another step Yes 
church family and all those tuning in, excited to share this message from Philippians part three entitled Others Focused. Today's Father's Day, so I want to shout out to all the dads out there, all the fathers, and just want to say thank you for your investment in your kids. And whether you're a a biological dad or a spiritual dad, fathers are so key and so important. And so I want to pray a blessing over you today as fathers, and I hope that you have some dad's root beer in honor of Father's Day. I picked some up uh, this last week, and we're going to celebrate today with that. So let's, uh, let's pray for you. Jesus, thank you for our fathers. Lord, thank you for how they've invested in our life. Thank you for the blessing that we as fathers get to speak out over our kids. I want to pray blessing on fathers today. I pray you'd encourage them, you'd build them up, you'd strengthen them. Uh, Lord, that the things that they say would truly build others up. And so give us life-giving words, encouragement, Lord, in every way. Bless our dads today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, next week, today's the 14th. Next week, uh, sorry, today's the 28th. What is today? Uh, It's the 21st today. And next week, we come back to the building at services at 9 and 11. Uh, We'll still be having church online as well, so if you can't join us, that's totally fine. We're meeting in the park today uh, on the 21st, and then next week again in the building at 9 and 11. So just want you to know, um, masks are optional, but I want you to know, if you want to wear a mask, and that's great. Like, feel free. If you feel safer that way, please do that. They're not required, but uh, we're going to have a great time worshiping together. But again, church is going to be online, so whatever you feel comfortable with and, and you re-enter uh, in the public gatherings as you see fit. All right, well, let's, let's look at Philippians uh, chapter 2, 1 to 18 today. If you want to suck the joy out of life, <laughs> become obsessed with your own happiness. If you want to, if you want to suck the joy out of life, um, steer clear from the Bible. Like, don't read the Bible, and you do that and actually apply what it says. You will, you will suck the joy out of your life. If if you want to, if you want to be miserable, become totally self-centered and self-focused. Um, make absolutely make no room for serving others if you want to suck the joy out of your life. And and so you know you might go, Kevin, that's so ridiculous. I mean, like. What have you, you been drinking today, Kev? And of course, I know you don't want that. I know you don't want a joyless life. And Paul is addressing the Philippian church, and he's saying, you can actually have joy and find joy in the midst of suffering. He was imprisoned, and over 19 times, it, he, he addresses this issue of joy. And he's saying, listen, you can find joy. Joy is different than happiness. Joy is that deep contentment, despite the circumstances. Even if circumstances are hard in that moment, you can find joy. And so, uh, in this series so far, we've talked about fellowship as a key ingredient to finding joy. We, we've, we've also talked about bragging on Jesus, so that sharing the good news of the gospel, bragging on him, and talking about what he's done in your life and those in lives of others is just so essential. And today, I, wanna, I want us to look at a few more things that Paul addresses here in, in verses 1 to 18 of chapter 2. And imagine a dashboard with three gauges. There's three gauges that I want you to kind of pay attention to that Paul's going to address in in your life and in my life. One is unity. The other is humility. And then the third one is obedience. So unity, humility, and obedience. Imagine those like on the dashboard of your car. And I want you, as we're we're going through this message and as you reflect on this afterwards, I want you to be thinking, how is how am I doing in the area of unity in my family, in my church, in my workplace? Am I a contributor to being more unified uh, or am I one who causes disunity? How's my humility? Am I self-consumed and self-focused, or am I others-focused? How's, how's my obedience? God, am I walking in obedience to your word and your ways, or am I just living a self-directed, kind of doing my thing and kind of ignoring the conviction of the Holy Spirit? So he's going to address those three big areas today. And so here's my first point, um, and actually kind of my first thought before I give you the first point. I've got three points today. 
lots of sub points, but three main points. Here's the first thought, and it's sort of the theme. A Christ-like life is an others-focused life. A Christ-like life is an others-focused life. A Christ-like life is an others-focused life. So here's my first point. Live selfless, stand united. Live selfless, stand united. Philippians 2, uh, 1, 1 and 2 first, this is, therefore, if there's any consolation in Christ, any comfort of love, any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. So now, and, and let me read 3 and 4 as well. It says, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Now, in the English, those are multiple sentences, but in the Greek, it's one continuous run-on sentence, basically, and, he's, and, the, and it starts with the word therefore, so he's reflecting on something that happened back in chapter 1 that he said, and in verse 27 of chapter 1, he, he says this, only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or I'm absent, I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit. There's that unity thing, with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. So he's saying live selfless and stand united. Your unity really matters. One key to unity is that you actually live a selfless life. And then he's going to give us some examples, the, the premium one being Jesus as, a, as the example of a selfless life. So Paul, he isn't doubting that these qualities exist in the Philippians, but he's, he is addressing an issue, it, it appears, that, that was happening, that there was some disunity happening. He's saying, listen, I know this exists among you, but pay attention, like you got to keep on this. This isn't something like you work on one time and then you're good for the rest of your life. No, no, this is an ongoing process of checking the gauge of unity and, and actually your self-focused or others-focused heart and going, am I living selfless? Am I living a Jesus life? So he's implying they had some growing up to do. And he's saying, is there any fellowship of the Spirit? Is there a koinonia happening? Is that, is that happening? Is, is that deep connection happening? If there's that, if there's, um, if, if there's this working in collaboration together, he's saying, fulfill my joy. Philippians, seriously, it would complete my joy, Paul is saying, if you would just be united in this effort. Because recognize that one of the greatest attacks of the enemy is disunity in your family, in your marriage, in the church. If he can get us fighting and bickering and at each other's throats, what's happening? Well, we don't have our eyes on Jesus and on the mission. We have our eyes on us and our problem. And, and we're causing problems. We're, 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 off, we're distracted from the mission. I think that's what the enemy loves. He loves that. He can't steal your salvation. He can't steal your marriage. He can't steal these things. But if he can get you distracted, get you disunified and off course and your eyes off Jesus, then you become self-consumed, self-focused, and ineffective. Remember, a Christ-like life is an others-focused life. Now, he's not saying that unity, when I say stand united, he's not saying be in a unimind, like everybody think the same, be robotic. No, no, no. He's, he's saying it's not uniformity, it's loving togetherness. It's a cooperation. It's, a, it's an honoring of each other's differences and different gifts. We're all different parts of the body. Pastor Shelley and your Devo this last week talked about some of us are thumbs and some of us are arms and elbows and some of us are, you know, torsos, whatever. Like we're all different parts of the body. Paul uses that analogy. And we need to honor each other. Like, we need each other. We work together, unified. And when we live selfishly like Jesus, then all of a sudden, things start to work. We are family. And I couldn't help but think of Sister Sledge. I mean, we are family. Anyway, I won't keep going, but you get it. Like, we're family. And we need each other. We work together. We're all different parts of the body. I like verses 3 and 4. Let me go there. It says, let nothing be done through selfish ambition. Or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Verse 4, let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Now, he talks about selfish ambition. Listen, ambition isn't bad. Ambition's actually good that you've got some drive, some fervor, some uh, internal motivation to go for it. But selfish ambition is where it starts to go wrong when it's self-centered ambition, when, it, when it's all about you. And then the progression in this verse three is that it grows up into conceit. And conceit is that preoccupation, excessive preoccupation with yourself. And so when you start to notice selfish ambition, then it grows up into conceit where you're just kind of, and I, just overly obsessed with you. And man, in our society, they celebrate that. We have phones so we can take selfies. We think that that's what they're for. 
you know, and we take pictures of all kinds of crazy things. Oh, there's nothing wrong with taking some pictures. I get that. But there is a preoccupation and a celebrated preoccupation with self in our society that we got to fight. We got to resist. We got to recognize that that's not necessarily Jesus's way. And, and he's saying when you're others focused, actually what happens is you are honoring the uh, Imago Dei, the image of God in other people. And it's an antidote. And that's when he says, esteem others better than yourself. He's not saying, think of yourself as a worm necessarily. He's saying, don't think about yourself too much. Think about others and how amazing they are and how God, and honor them by recognizing God created them and made them amazing and beautiful. And when you honor and reflect on their value, all of a sudden you start to recognize and develop a mindset that it's a privilege to get to know each person you meet, no matter how different they are from you. And I think that's what's one of the beautiful things about this this uh, privilege we have called life is we get to know people and get to know their differences and actually we can celebrate the differences versus, um, you know, go, well, they're not like me, so I don't. So, so just recognize it's a privilege. If you have that attitude and that mindset, it's a privilege to get to know people and look for the gold and mine out the gold in them and the unique thing that God is doing in them or wants to do in each person. Maybe they don't even know God yet, but God made them. And they just are in an undiscovered state in the sense of they, God knows them, but they don't know, them, know themselves really because until they know Christ, they don't fully know who they really are. So live selfless and stand united. So unity is that first gauge. The second gauge is humility. It's, it's this point, humble yourself and be like Jesus. Humble yourself, be like Jesus. Verse five, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus who being the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God but made himself of no reputation taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Now this, this chunk of scripture, 6 through 11, is like one of the most theologically deep and impactful passages in the New Testament. It's really key. It's really important. I am not going to do it full justice today. We, we could spend a, several weeks just unpacking those 6 through 11, those verses. Um, but I want to I touch on a few things in it, and I want you to read it this week and pray about it, think about it. But let's look at verse 5. It says, let this mind, which was also in Christ Jesus. So it's, notice it's not about how you feel or how we feel. He said, let this mind, let this thinking, the mind of Christ be in you. So that means it's available for us. As a matter of fact, the scripture says we have the mind. You've been given the mind of Christ, but we have to work out the mind of Christ in us and, and, be, and submit and let it transform our thinking. But it's available. It's there. We have that mind of Christ. So help me to think like Jesus today. In verse 6, it says, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. So Jesus says even in John 10, 30, the Father and I are one. Jesus had every right to be called God. He was equal with the Father, and it says it right here. He, it's, it's, he didn't consider it robbery to be equal with God. He's always been. Jesus has always been there, and, and, and he was, he's from, from the beginning. He's always been there forever, um, and so verse 7 says, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. Now, in the Greek, uh, kino is the Greek word here for that section, uh, made, made himself no reputation, meaning in some, some translations say Jesus emptied himself. When he came to earth, he emptied himself. So, but he didn't, he did, what did he empty himself of? Well, he didn't empty himself of his godness, of his deity, of his divine nature. He emptied himself of his divine privileges his, and his divine powers. So that's key. Jesus, because there are some heresies out there that Jesus threw away God, his God, his divinity. No, 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 no. He was still divine. He was still God. He was still equal with the Father. But when he came to earth, he put on man. He, he, he also had, so he was fully God and fully man combined. Amazing. But what's fascinating is when it says he emptied himself or he made himself of no reputation, he actually chose to uh, submit himself fully 
to his human side. So he experienced everything we experienced. Now, this is called the doctrine of kenosis, which is, that's fancy, but fancy words, but the implications are so huge and so encouraging to us. It means everything that Jesus did on, here, here's what it means. Everything that Jesus did on this planet, the miracles, the prayers, the walking on the water, the insight into the woman at the well, the teachings he gave, were not done in his own power. They weren't done with his divine power. They were done fully submitted to the Father, empowered by the Holy Spirit, just like you and I. And even John 5.30 says this, I can't of myself do nothing, Jesus is saying. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is righteous, because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. So Jesus healed, he prayed, he taught through the power of the Holy Spirit as he followed the directives of the Father. Remember, Jesus said, I go to the Father and I only do what the Father is doing. So he's always about his Father's business. He didn't, he didn't slip over and tap in to his divine rights and privileges. He said, no, I'm coming to this earth 33 years on mission, on purpose. I'm, I'm gonna lay aside my rights and privileges. I'm still God, but I'm not gonna access my God privileges and I'm gonna walk this life on this planet out so that I'm an example to you and I that everything that can be done can be done led by the Holy Spirit, coming from the Father, led by the Holy Spirit, and empowered by the Holy Spirit to walk out what God's up to on this planet. And so he's our ultimate example. It's incredible. And you might go, okay, okay, I'm trying to wrap my head around this, Kevin, a little bit. Just so... Let me give you an example. Like I was, which it's hard to find a parallel example. But I was thinking, in our modern society, what would be an example? This this would be like Jesus, like setting aside his divine rights, would be like the Queen of England, who's now ninety four, right? All of a sudden, one day, decides, um, I want to be like every other normal person in the world. <laughs> and now she's still the queen, right? But she lays aside all of her rights as queen. She's like, I'm not going to access the money, the bank accounts, the houses, the cars, the privileges. Uh, I, I'm just going to go, like, she, gets, she puts on some plain clothes, uh, walks out to the edge of Buckingham Palace Gate, and, you know, she probably doesn't even have a phone, so maybe she has to bum a phone off somebody, calls an Uber, says, take me to the local coffee shop. She goes to the local coffee shop. And she's sitting there, just kind of chill, and she's looking through the paper at 94 to find a a job, because she has no money. So she's got to get a job. So she's looking through the classifieds, trying to figure out what the job is, and I don't even know, she's probably on the internet there. She goes to an internet cafe, and she looks, and she's she's got to find a job so she can get some money, so she can find a place to live, so she can, all the things that you and I do, she wasn't, even though she's still the queen, by right, she is, but She's not accessing her, her privileges as the queen. Again, it's not a perfect analogy, but you get it. it. It just seems so ridiculous. And that's what's so amazing is that Jesus humbled himself and became a servant, he says. Incredible. I just, I just want you to let that sink in. And, and, and joy, Paul is saying, joy can spring up within you when you humble yourself And be like Jesus. Follow his example. And in in this chapter, we won't go to it, but he he talks about Timothy and Epaphroditus as other examples of earthly people who were really, you know, had the joy of the Lord, but but did it by service and serving and humbling themselves and walking and serving others and blessing others. They had an others-focused life because a Christ-like life is an others-focused life. All right. So let's go to um, uh, eight verses eight through eleven. It says this, being found in the appearance as a man, speaking of Jesus, he humbled himself, became obedient to the point of death, even death of the cross. So here we see the gospel wrapped up in a very few verses. And therefore, so he, he had the ultimate humbling, which was to not only to become man and to lay aside his divine rights and privileges, but then to succumb to death a human death, but not just any kind of death, the most excruciating, lowly death. I mean, and this is when it says death on the cross here, that would have been so impactful to the Philippians because in their city, it was considered not even the worst criminals in that city. They had rights, and one of the rights was you could be punished, but death on the cross was considered too, too uh, lowly for a, for a Philippian, someone in Philippi. And, um, and so you couldn't do it. 
So there in verse nine says, therefore God has highly exalted him. So we see a switch. He's, low, he's humbled himself. And then the father exalts Jesus here in this next few verses. God highly exalts him and, given, and gives him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So you see the gospel laid out here, see the humbling, uh, humbling of Jesus, and the Father exalts Jesus and gives him the name above every name. There's so many more verses here that we could just unpack, but I'm gonna, for the sake of time, I'm gonna move on. But I just know this, that's why Romans 10, 9 and 10 is such a big deal, because it says, if you're out there and you're listening and you don't know Jesus, you've seen the gospel that Jesus came right here. He came on purpose, humbled himself, said, I'll take your sin and my sin, uh, upon himself and I'll pay a penalty for it, a price for it. I'll die this excruciating death. He was buried. He rose again. He defeated death on our behalf. And verse 9 and 10 of Romans 10 says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord, the Lord Jesus, the Master Jesus, the Savior Jesus, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. So you believe with your heart, it says in verse 10, under righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So, Humble yourself and be like Jesus. So the unity gauge, how's your humility? We addressed it in the James series, but Paul addresses it again here. It's just such a big deal because our, our flesh wants to be prideful. Our, our ambition wants to become self-centered and self-focused. Uh, but he's saying, let your ambition be others-focused. Uh, way, another way to look at this is if you can imagine two circles, and, and, and this circle represents your life, are the arrows all pointing to you, or are the arrows going out from you? I hope that makes sense. Are the arrows of, in the energy of your life going towards you, self-focused, or are the arrows in the energy of your life going outward, helping others, others focused? It's key. Jesus' life was all about you and I and others and doing the will of the Father, which was to come and help us get to know him. The third thought is this, you see here in these verses is, and it's a key to joy, is to work out your salvation. Another key to joy is to work out your salvation. Look at verses 12, look at verse 12 first. It says, therefore my beloved, as you've always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation. It's not working for your salvation, it's not working to earn your salvation, but he's saying what God has worked in you, now you need to work it out. It's like going to the gym, you need to exercise your salvation. You need to strengthen it. You need to activate the salvation that God has already freely given you. Notice that it says also here in verse 12, it says work out your own salvation. So I don't need to work out somebody else's salvation. I get to share the good news, and the salvation begins, and they begin a relationship with Christ when they say yes and confess Jesus is Lord, as we just read in Romans 10. But he's saying, listen, you need to work out your own salvation. So what's God working in your heart right now? What, what is he wanting to change in you? What is God pinpointing in this season of your life? What is God calling you to do? Because we're in a relationship with God, not a contract. Not, not, no, no, we're in a relationship, and the Holy Spirit has been given to us to highlight areas in our life that God wants to address and deal with. He's saying, then we have the privilege of then, as he shows us things that he wants to change and transform and work, we need to work it out. So there's a process, there's, there's maturity that needs to come and happen in our lives. And he's saying, do it with fear and trembling, in the end of verse 12, he's saying, with reverence and awe, let God's sculpting of your life come as you submit yourself to him. So, so he's saying, giving, give serious and mindful and intentional thought with reverence and awe to the fact that God is sculpting your life. Don't resist the sculpting. Don't resist the process. Philippians 13 213 rather, it's God who works in you. This is interesting. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. So he's just saying, listen, God is working this out in you. And, 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 and he's got a plan and he, he reads the plan and he knows the plan and he's got it and he wants to work it out. He's working, uh, he's gonna clearly show you your part, but you gotta recognize God's got a master plan. And there's a, 
great tension in this because you see God's part and you see our part as the ones working out our own salvation that's been worked in us. We're running it out. And then also there's other people involved, and that's where the unity comes in. It's like, listen, we're not isolated and doing this relationship with God alone, although we have our own salvation. We're also doing it in conjunction, in community with other believers. So he says, pay attention to your unity. Recognize that humility is the posture, the mindset of which you need to have, just like Christ Jesus, the same mind that was in Christ in verse 5. And then recognize, too, here that you've got a process of working out, so don't be stagnant. Don't be, don't be a Christian couch potato. Like, don't be a lazy Christian. Be an ambitious Christian, but not a selfish, ambitious Christian. Be a godly, ambitious Christian. And, and I was trying to think of how do I, you know, how do I put this in a way that is understandable, but it's, it's, like, it's like God is the project manager, and if I could put on my hard hat, you see God over there with his hard hat, and he's on site, and it's this big construction project. It's a big development, and God's roaming around. He's looking, and he's working on things. He's talking to people, and you go over, and you say, hey, God, what do you, what do you have for me today? What's my part today? And he's like, listen, I need you to go over here and I need you to put those forms down on that part of the land right over there and we need to pour concrete tomorrow. So go ahead and you get the forms and get those laid out and I've got, I've got Largent to come in and do the pouring of the concrete and then I'll have Ryan come in and he'll take the forms off. That'll be another day. You just, you just get the forms ready and get them in place. Okay. And so he's saying, listen, part of working our salvation is recognizing every day the Holy Spirit gives us directives coming from his word and spending time with him to walk out this unique call that each of us have as different parts in the body of Christ. And, and he says he's also, uh, he works in us, he, it says to will and to do. Let me read that again. God works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure, verse 13. And so he's saying, listen, he's transforming even our will, as well as changing our actions so that we do it. He's, he's transforming us internally. But it's not a passive transaction. It's active. Verse 14, do all things without, and then he kind of gets really practical. He says, okay, so as, this, as you're working out your salvation, here's some things you need to know. Do all things, verse 14, without complaining and, and disputing. So again, he's like, when you start getting upset and whiny and complaining and you're starting to fight and get angry, warning light, let the warning light go off. He's saying, and you, when that warning light goes off, let that be a warning when you're, angry, upset, fighting, complaining, talk to God about it. Go, God, I, rather than just lash out at other people and even internally, talk to God about it. It says, verse 15, that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. He's saying, as you're working out your salvation, as I'm helping form your will, uh, God's will in you, and, and then you're doing it and you're walking it out, you know, be smart. When you're struggling, complaining, whining, talk to me about it. Let me, let me pinpoint what's going on in that area and help you grow. And he goes, recognize you're shining as lights in the world, but how bright are you? Are you? Do you have like the dimmer switch way down and you're just barely on? Or are you, uh, are you bright, a bright light? We're called to be shine as lights in dark places. And, and, and lights become, lights are so great because light makes things evident, light makes things safer. Light reveals things that could cause harm, and, and we can bring resolution to it. Verse 16, hold fast to the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. So hold, hold the word of God with strength. Hold it as a guide for truth. Hold the word of God. Ugh, just to have it in front of you. That's why we need to be in it every day, wrestling with the truth of it and how it works out in us and in working out our salvation. A Christ-like life is an others-focused life. <laughs> and, and, and guys, the, 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 Jesus' example is, is just right in the center of this chunk of Scripture, verses 1 through 18. And 6 through 11 is, is the passage. He's just saying, look at Jesus' example. It's the most extreme example of humbling yourself, of living selflessly. Jesus' life. I mean, he is God. But yet he, lay, he empties himself, he lays aside his divine privileges, comes to earth as a man to show us and to walk out a life empowered by the Holy Spirit, directed by the Father. And he did that so you and I, he was tempted in every way, just like you are, but yet he didn't sin. So he, he showed us that you can do it. And he didn't, he didn't 
He didn't tap into those divine powers. He didn't kind of just secretly go, I'll just do it. I'll just tap into that today. No, 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 no. He walked it out just like he asked you and I to walk it out. So, as wrapping this up, the gauges, unity, humility, obedience. Because obedience is the key to this last thing, working out your salvation. When God highlights something, it's walking in obedience to the truth. Where are you at? How you doing? And I want to pray for you right now that the Holy Spirit would give you that insight to go, is, is my, ah, am I causing disunity? Am, am, is there an area that's off kilter there? What about humility? Do I, am I just too self-consumed? Or, or in the area of obedience, there's something God's asked me to do that I haven't obeyed yet. Let me pray for you. Jesus, would you, I know by your spirit, by the Holy Spirit, you're, you're touching hearts right now. You're, you're communicating to people. There's people here that that's one of those things has touched them today. God, would they submit that to you? Would they give that to you? Would they walk in humility and walk in unity and walk in obedience to you? God, to, to live a others-focused life, that Christ-like life that you, your example so perfectly shares with us, we can't do it on our own. And, and, and it's because of you, Jesus, that we can live that life because you empowered us and gave us the strength and the access to the Holy Spirit so that we could walk this life out humbly uh, as servants of you, fulfilling your mission. So God, I pray that as we think about this today, as we discuss this today, Lord, you would begin to just, uh, just do what only you can do, and that's just move on each heart. And if you don't know Jesus today, uh, I want to give you an opportunity. If you, you've said, I, Kevin, I, I see that Jesus paid that price for me, offers this gift of grace and love to me today. I want, I want that. Just agree with this prayer. Dear Jesus, forgive me of my sin. I give you my life. I surrender it to you today afresh. Whether, I'm, whether I did that 30 years ago and I've just been distant from you or whether it's the first time today, I say yes to you today, Jesus, in your name. Amen. If you made that decision, we want to help you. We want to get you started on this journey. And, and just text in RCC Life uh, to 97000. And we've got a series of four videos we want to send you to get you started. Just baby steps. Uh, to growing in Jesus. And so text that in, RCC Life to 97000. And uh, we'll see you next week. Uh, It's going to be fun. See you here online and see you live on the 28th at 9 and 11 at River City Church. Bless you.